morning, Mayor and, and members of council. Uh, it's been a few years since uh, I'm my, oh yeah, for the record, Ben Hershenson, President of uh, Fairwinds Homeowners Association. It's been a few years since I've given a lecture, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, it'll take about an hour and a half, but is that okay? <laughs> Uh, it'll, it'll take a few minutes. Uh, well, listen, I, I don't have an opportunity very often. So I got to take a chance. Uh, I want to thank Chris for, for uh, take, uh, take, accepting my request uh, to sponsor this. And uh, uh, I think what, we're always talking about clean water, and we want to do our part in my association uh, that everybody else is trying to do as well. Uh, without clean water, we don't have any tourist uh, situation here, and we, when we really need to do all we can. Now, I know a lot of larger HOAs probably already are doing what we just have begun to do, and I understand that. But in the smaller HOA, over the years, what has happened at Fairwinds, originally they, were, they planted littoral plants around the lake. That was what the developer did. It was a single row of plants. And over the years, different landscaping companies came in and would weed whack a mole right down to the water's edge. And a lot of uh, similar HOAs in the area were developed with a very clean look. In other words, where basically they would mow right down to the water's edge. That in and of itself creates a, a, a formula for disaster down the road. This all began uh, back last June uh, when I noticed there were some air, small areas of erosion around our retention pond. I contacted our lake management company. Uh, they suggested uh, horrible things like riprap, man-made devices, all of which were terribly expensive and probably would have wiped us out if we had done it. And I said, there's got to be a better way. So I'm thinking, well, with my own background, what, not, what about using plants? And specifically, maybe focus in on using some native uh, uh, plants that could be planted around the lake in a much thicker zone than what we had originally. Well, a member of my community who's here today, uh, J uh, Jay Newman, came up to me after the meeting and said, Ben, he said, I have a suggestion. A friend of mine is a professor at FGCU in the water school, and maybe he has some uh, ideas that uh, could be beneficial. So I contacted uh, Dr. Douglas uh, at FGCU. I told him a little bit about my background, and uh, he, he made this comment uh, in an email. This is the first email. Quote, I'm delighted to learn that a practitioner of plant science is at the helm of the Fairwinds HOA. End of quote. Now, how could you not like a guy like that? And I said, we're gonna hit it off, I could just tell. Well, anyway, he came out to the community with a colleague of his. Uh, we did actually a, a botanizing trip. We, saw, we found numerous plants, and even in a very cursory way, we found 25 native uh, plants uh, that uh, we could have used. So this led to the project that was undertaken by uh, FGCU along with us. We created a, a zone of responsibility 15, 20 feet from the water's edge, no more chemicals, no mowing down to the water's edge, and we also haven't stopped using any chemicals uh, in our lake. And that's where we are right now. And at this point, uh, uh, Dr. Douglas brought some of his students there, and that began the project. So it is my pleasure, without going any further, uh, that, uh, I, that I have the opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, James uh, Douglas, who is the Associate Professor, Department of Marine and Earth Sciences at FGCU. James. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm very impressed by this group's uh, efficiency and how fast you've been going through the agenda items, and I'm gonna try to respect that by going quickly through the remarks that I'd repaired, prepared. Um, uh, so I may skip over a, a few images here. Backward, laser. Fantastic. Uh, all right, uh, well, Dr. Hershenson explained it well. This uh, uh, remarks today are about one example of an HOA in the community where we're applying some uh, environmental ideas to the pond management that we think would be a good example for uh, the, the town at large. So the, the first thing I wanna make sure we're on, all on the same page about is, is what are all of these ponds, these man-made ponds in our community for? Um, there's there are really two purposes. They've been required since 1982 for two purposes. The first purpose is to prevent flooding, and the second purpose is to reduce pollution. Uh, they're doing a pretty good job of preventing flooding because they're well engineered, but they don't always do a good job of preventing pollution because they're not always appropriately managed. 
Uh, so the real question when it comes to how do these ponds prevent pollution is, is the water that flows out of the ponds downstream and into the ocean more clean than the water that flowed into the ponds? Uh, and that turns out to depend on how the ponds are managed. So what does a well-managed pond look like? It actually looks more like a wetland, uh, something you'd find out it, east in, in the city than, uh, than a, a, a typical pond you might see on a golf course. So. Uh, this uh, pond is on a university campus in the Midwest. It's, it's full of uh, plants. And these uh, plants are what allow it to remove pollution from the water. So they're really integral to the, the pond's intended function. Now, if um, we look at sort of a schematic of this, you can see the slope of the pond and a cutaway here is covered with all sorts of different types of, of native plants. Uh, that holds the slope in place, addresses the erosion problem that Ben was uh, originally brought me to the Fairwinds Pond, um, but that also catches the uh, pollution in the runoff and takes pollution out of the water. Uh, the water level, because we have a wet and dry season here, goes up and down in our ponds a lot, and this makes the erosion problems worse, which is why it's very important to have plants, water plants, all the way along the slope. Um, a lot of our ponds around here look very clean and tidy uh, because they have this sort of aesthetics-driven pond management. Uh, but this type of pond, my fellow researchers at FGCU have found, does not function well. In fact, the quality of the water that leaves these uh, very mani manicured ponds is oftentimes worse than the water that comes in. So it's, it's sort of like uh, putting your vacuum on in reverse and spraying dirt all over your house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very counterproductive. Um, and the reason why is because with the uh, mowed grass and, and chemically treated grass right to the edge, uh, there's a lot of lawn chemical runoff into the pond. Uh, also because the natural plants are eliminated by weed whacking and spraying around the edge of this kind of pond, there's nothing to catch uh, and, and process the pollution. There's a lot of erosion problems. And because a lot of pollution builds up in the pond, they have chronic algae blooms, which end up being treated with chemicals by the lake management companies. But that becomes sort of a cycle of an algae bloom, a chemical treatment, and an algae bloom, which leaves the water just sort of a soup of pollution, uh, which uh, is very harmful when it enters our estero bay and uh, other waterways. So um, the very simple sort of restoration scheme that we'd like to propose is um, sort of taking, making better use of these thousands of ponds that we have here. Uh, currently, we think that they're not working well because so many of them have the vegetation suppressed, uh, but all we really need to do is let vegetation recover in these areas, and we think that the pond water quality will improve, which will lead to improved water quality on the coast and lessened algae blooms and, and better real estate values, all these good things. And so the Fairwinds is our proof of concept here. So let me just, this is a picture of the Fairwinds pond. It looks like a very typical neighborhood pond. Um, it's a, a nice looking pond. This is a picture taken last August. Um, and uh, there, uh, there are some problems with this pond though that we identified. So what, what brought us in was the eroding banks, uh, but we also saw that it had some of these um, uh, inappropriate types of management with mowing all the way to the edge. There had also been a lot of herbicide use around the pond, which had uh, led to this sort of bare zone around the edge, which is more apparent at, uh, at uh, low water levels. Uh, and it had a few plants, um, but a, a high proportion of those were non-native plants, which still do okay for water quality, but they're not as nice for the environment as the native plants. So we came up with this plan. Um, uh, ben came up with the name Zone of Responsibility, which is just making sure that there's no um, mowing or spraying all along the border of the pond and allow plants to regrow in that pond border zone, which is called a littoral zone. Uh, and my group at the water school uh, came out to the pond to monitor the plants and water quality and see how things proceeded as we did this because we wanted to get really good data on how this kind of thing would work, if it would be effective, uh, and take the show on the road if, if it was as effective as we thought it would be. We also did some selective weeding of the non-native plants uh, and replacing them with native plants. Um, so we, we did very careful surveys of the vegetation using this uh, transect method with these squares where we would look at the vegetation. Um, while we did this, uh, this survey, um, uh, a little oops happened. Um, the message didn't get through about the zone of responsibility to the lake manager, and the lake manager came and sprayed Roundup all over the plants on the edge. <laughs> So, but this is something that they, that's sort of the, the common practice for all of the ponds around here, unfortunately. 
Um, but it sort of gave us the perfect opportunity to see in our data what the effects of that were. And um, you don't need to, to strain your eyes looking at this data, but what it, what it shows basically is uh, Roundup kills everything, right? which everyone knows, right? But uh, that's, that's not good when you're trying to foster a plant community for water quality. Um, uh, but uh, we got the message through, and since uh, they stopped spraying around it, we've seen that this bare zone with the erosion is beginning to uh, regrow, and it's nice to see all these beautiful little plants. Uh, in fact, there's a picture here taken by uh, one of the residents, Jane Newman, of a beautiful native wildflower with a honeybee uh, pollinating it. So there's, there's um, a lot of benefits to the environment of having these plants regrow in the area around ponds. Um, uh, we're also doing a, an experiment along with this restoration, uh, seeing what happens in two cases, one where we completely leave it alone and the other where we go in and pick out the non-native plants and put in native plants. So we did uh, strips along the side where we tried both of these methods. And uh, we had a lot of great help with this from students at Florida Gulf Coast University and also a high school student who's a Boy Scout, brought his Boy Scout troop out for his Eagle Scout project, and this is them weeding out the non-native plant there. So it's a nice way to get the community involved. Um, with all of this plant material that we remove from the pond of the non-native plants, we want to make good use of it. So we've been composting it at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University's organic garden to sort of complete the, the nutrient cycle. Um, and this is, shows a picture of the, the Eagle Scout replanting uh, native plants around the pond. Um, uh, we want to see if these changes to the pond uh, affect the water quality because that's our ultimate goal. So we're also using our graduate students and our water school resources to monitor the water quality of the pond and we expect the water quality to improve as the plants establish and they start filtering the water. Um, and we want to use this example to jumpstart more uh, eco-friendly pond management in the area and uh, so I've got three recommendations related to that. Uh, one is that uh, a municipal government like uh, yourself can sort of um, pr promote uh, pond rules that uh, foster the functionality of these ponds. So not just looks, but make sure that the way ponds are managed uh, supports their intended function of improving water quality. So that means having this border zone look more like a wetland. Uh, the, the second uh, recommendation is to, to use science for this. Most of the water quality in ponds around here is not regularly tested, uh, so we don't really know if they're effective or not. And so having more um, regular water quality testing at more of our ponds will help us identify the ponds that are performing well and the ones that need help. Uh, the third recommendation is education. Um, because a lot of times these management decisions are made by small HOAs that may not have the right information on what's healthy for a pond, making sure that we get information out through uh, researchers at, uh, at environmental organizations in the water school to HOA leaders and elected officials uh, and that those messages uh, get to the lake management landscaping contractors who are uh, doing the, the management of the ponds. Uh, and, and my final thought here is that uh, these ponds are part of the watershed, the area of land that drains into uh, the ocean. Uh, but the watershed includes everything around us, not just the ponds. Uh, and the same principle of plants can help us uh, was identified by our Ar Arbor Day presenter. Um, trees can help us, but really plants anywhere um, can, can help us. And there are other areas where this uh, let plants grow approach could help, including our dry detention ponds, which don't always have water in them, but also have a water quality function and flood control function in the area. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. Yes, sir. I have this from Lover's Key. You were there and I was there. Yeah. And it's, it, I was wondering if you could hand out, if you could s deliver a bunch of these to the city, and we could distribute them. Sure thing, I have it, a... It shows yes and no. I, I don't see any fish in these ponds. I don't see any wading birds. I, they look like they're completely dead. Um, well, yeah, that's one of the things that can happen with uh, the chemical treatment. Uh, not only it's, it's intended to kill algae, but it, it really kills everything, and oftentimes the fish die in the ponds. There's still fish in the Fairwinds Pond, um, and uh, we know this because my undergraduate students didn't get the memo that they weren't supposed to fish in the pond, and they sent me a bunch of pictures of bass that they caught in the pond. Well, good, um, good, good, good. And I said, don't tell Ben! Um, but uh, 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 the mosquitoes. Um, 
Well, uh, so that's uh, you know an, an, an interesting issue, but uh, the plants won't make the mosquitoes any worse. The plants provide a place for small fish to hide, and small fish eat mosquitoes. Um, but I imagine that there are uh, a variety of concerns that uh, people might raise when they see weeds growing around their pond, right? Uh, and I would be happy to uh, talk to people or provide information um, that might uh, help ease the transition from these sort of uh, ineffective ponds to the more wetland style ponds because if people aren't used to looking at that um, they m might uh, have anxiety about uh, more plants growing. Doesn't the mosquito control spray these ponds and kill all the mosquitoes? Um, they do uh, use mosquito treatments on many of the ponds um, and mosquito control has a, a pretty scientific approach, so they try to cause the minimum collateral damage. Um, but that's that's sort of another uh, uh, you know tricky scientific issue. You know how to uh, keep mosquitoes at bay without killing the honeybees and the other things that we want in the environment. I'd like to see a lot of fish. You know, you know yeah. bass. I love the way they hit. Bam! They, they hit a plug on the top of the water. They really. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, um, you, you see people fishing in these ponds all the time. They're the ones of them that do have fish in them. So it's potentially a, a really nice thing for communities, whether you like to look at the fish or, or catch the fish. Um, uh, there's a big attraction. And bird watchers as well. There's certainly a lot more wildlife can make use of a pond if it's got these natural plants around it than when it's just bare. Uh, yes, Councilman. Um, just two comments. One, um, <clears throat> I know in your suggestions you gave a connection between the homeowners association and the contractors. Right. <clears throat> I think you should start with the contractors because uh, certainly in the larger communities, and this is our experience in a gated community in which I live, is that we hire contractors to do that. So um, those are the people that need to really be educated and um, so when they come into the community, they usually it's usually a partnership with the homeowners association. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to do both. That's my one um, comment. Yeah, the right. I think a lot can go right or wrong right. in that relationship right. between the HOA and the contract. But but if the, if you keep educating them and drilling it's drilling that into them, I think many communities already have these kinds of systems in place. Maybe not to the extent that you're proposing, which brings me to my second point. I recently went to the Naples Botanical Garden. They invited elected officials in Southwest Florida. And um, they are always improving their system. They, have a, they are developing a pond system towards the back of their property that does just what you're saying. So if somebody is concerned about weeds, I suggest they go down to Naples Bo Botanical Garden and see those ponds and how they've, it's so stunningly beautiful that anyone that doesn't want to go in your route because they don't think it's going to look good ought to go down there and see what they're doing. And they're doing exactly the same thing, natural plants, diversity, not just put the one kind of uh, grass or whatever you're putting in there, but put a lot of different things in there so you can actually make a garden, it's hard to believe, about a, from a filter pond. I was very impressed with it. And in our community, we're fortunate, at least around a golf course, we have Maybe not enough, but we have virtually what you're talking about. We, we don't allow mowing close to the pond, and, and they have a variety of things. So we have a lot of birds, and we have fish. So I guess, I guess something must be right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, um, with 8,000 ponds, there's some examples of mm -hmm. good ones and, uh, oh, yeah. and, and dysfunctional ones. And, um, finding, and the Naples Botanical Garden, of course, is the best example uh, around of a, a well-managed uh, natural pond. Yeah, but I mean, they, that's one of their new ponds, that their new uh, projects that they're <laughs> developing, because they didn't have that before. They just had like wild down there. Um, and again, to just make your point about the 8,000 ponds, I think in our community we have 23 ponds. I don't know if all 23 are good, but a large percentage of them are good, so we should go after those right. few that may not be uh, handled in the proper way. Right. Um, yeah, and you know, with these uh, lake, lake managers, I uh, scratch my head about this issue sometimes a lot because you know they do receive training and I think many of them know what to do but they may be under a lot of pressure to meet a certain aesthetic for the community um, uh, and there aren't really strong laws or regulations about how you have to uh, 
uh, mow. So we're sort of asking them to do this out of, uh, out of the goodness of your heart, will you leave the plants? But, but it re really, it, it sort of comes down to uh, um, the, or the orders they get or what they want to do to keep, keep the contract. So um, uh, it, it's probably going to take all levels, talking to the HOA and, and the contractors. Uh, I just want to, if I could just add to yeah. this, Amy. Uh, and smaller HOAs have a real serious problem. You have a landscape company, and let's face it, there's tremendous turnover with the staff constantly. So this is a constant battle. And a lot of smaller HOA communities, they have a, man, a lake management company. They don't pay much attention. They pay so much a month, the, the technician comes in, sprays, and then leaves. This is why I think uh, Dr. Douglas is trying to reach, push this point that it really has to be the HOA, a smaller HOA, to manage what goes on in their community. And sometimes they delegate responsibility, and that responsibility sometimes is just not very responsible, I guess. And it's a shame that this is happening. For me personally, uh, I can't say that I have to worry about gray hair, but it is getting thinner and thinner and thinner because I, there's nothing left to pull out anymore because I get so frustrated how many times I've spoken with the, the landscape. It's not his fault, but the staffing, he speaks to them, tells them not to mow, but it's going to be a constant battle. Otherwise, this whole research project could go, could go literally to pot if, if somebody doesn't pay attention. So I think that these HOAs have to take more responsibility, in my opinion, so that when they have a lake co company come in, understand what they're doing, and maybe you can create something like this, which would be a heck of a lot better than using chemicals. Hey, Fred, you got a comment? Yeah, I do. Uh, have you talked to South Florida Water Management District? Because they have the authority to go out and inspect banks of ponds and they make a lot of HOAs redo their ponds because of the erosion and all that. If you could get them on your side, you would have another big arm of the government, which has got a lot of teeth in it. Because there are HOAs that had to spend two and three and four million bucks redoing the banks of their ponds and all that. So that, That's a great idea. Um, I have worked for the South Florida Water Management District before and some of my former graduate students now work there so that'll be a good connection good. and I can find out what sort of resources and recommendations they have um, and uh, maybe through the city we can uh, sort of help promote the sort of state standards for, for best practices for ponds. Um, I think uh, any of us who uh, have some ability to reach people and get folks to listen to us should make sure that we're give, giving a, a good message about how to manage these ponds. Okay, can we wrap this up? Yep. Well, Thanks. again, thank you very much. I think we accomplished a lot. Of, uh, as you can see, Dr. Douglas is right on this, and, and we're really excited very about good. this arrangement. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr.